Good afternoon. Welcome back to Senate Education on January 26. We are now going to shift our attention to our career to career technical education. We know that this was a priority outlined by the governor. It's also, I think it's safe to say, a priority of our committee to do whatever we can to not only better understand what's happening at our career technical institutions, but how can we help our career technical institutions. One of the things we have heard uh, early on is that there might be, and I'll just sort of tee this up, Ms. Emerson, and we can hear your testimony. There might be, we might be limiting people who can get those, take career technical education. So that's one of the things we're, we're looking at. Uh, in some ways, are we limiting things? I know Senator Gulick has raised the question and the point that maybe some schools don't willingly transfer, let, let kids into career technical institutions. These are me, my sort of taking her, blame me if somebody's watching from Burlington, uh, <laughs> uh, and not letting those dollars go as easily. Um, but. I, for one, and I think everybody here really sees career technical education as incredibly important to Vermont kids, no matter if this is a permanent career or if they're trying to enhance their lives, you know, college ready kind of classes or just looking for, for a new skill. So that's a little bit about where we're at with it and uh, glad you could join us. And Thank you. I know we have some testimony in our folder. The floor is yours. Thank you. So I did prepare some testimony, and Please. then what you just said may spark yeah, some, might spark some additions. Yeah. Hi, my name is Jody Emerson. Thank you for having me here. I'm the superintendent and director of the Central Vermont Career Center School District in the Central Vermont Career Center. I started as director last year, and previously I was in regular ed as an associate principal at U32 for eight years, and then 14 years teaching social studies at Spalding High School. Both of them are Sunday schools to me. My son is also a graduate of the Randolph Technical Career Center, and I really did watch him kind of bide his time, especially in middle and high school, until he could get to, to education that was engaging for him. And unfortunately, it wasn't until he was there that I realized just how much he had access to when he was there. So even though I taught at Spalding, which was right next door to my career center, I didn't know what kids had access to when they were there. He got over 70 certificates in the diesel program there, working on Peterbilt stuff and tons of different IRCs, so industry recognized credentials. So I learned a lot just watching my son and his experience and then reaching out and learning more about other technical centers. So um, I also learned in recent testimony that was given to APA, um, who are consultants that came and did listening sessions in our state related to Act 127, that some parents um, feel like there is this barrier because um, of special education. So. There's a few things that relate, because for Perkins funding, we have to prove that our students are getting either industry-recognized credentials, they have access to them, or they have access to college credits in every single program we offer. And so for some students, that could be a barrier. I know that the previous person who was talking here from CCV talked about AccuPlacer. Our students can also access CCV courses with WorkKeys, which is another assessment that ACT does, and we, we give that to all of our students. So I think it's important if they earn a five to a seven in work keys, they can also access some college courses through us without taking the AccuPlacer. And they get a national career readiness certificate from that. So what, I'm, what I came here to talk about was um, a small pilot project that I'm actually doing with VTC right now. Um, my emergency services instructor in collaboration with the paramedic program at VTC in Williston took on two second year students this year. So they took emergency services last year with him. First round they did the EMT test and our certified EMTs. And this year came back to do a paramedic training. And we've been working with VTC to make that happen. Um, there, there are barriers, honestly, between working with, so the first argument was whose student are they? Are they my student at the Career Center because we get the tuition dollars or are they VTC student? at the college and get the tuition dollars there. And we were able to agree that for this trial run, um, last spring we talked about this, so before you got involved actually, um, and we agreed that we would be able to pay for them, they would be my students, my instructor would be a co-instructor in the paramedic course because he does teach it. 
and that they would attend my center for three days a week and then they would go up and today's the day so they're not here with me to help give you any information about that they would go up to the Williston campus and, and participate in that paramedicine uh, hands-on component and then we would pay for anything above and beyond fast forward credits because it's dual enrollment fast forward for CTE we get six credits per semester is allowable for a student and these courses are 12 credits each so we would pay the additional from, from the tuition we receive to VTC to allow our students to take it without having to pay any costs. So we paid for the first round, um, it ended up being like 7,000, a little over 7,000 for both students and we'll be paying again for this semester so that they can get that component done. Uh, so I'm kind of skipping around and not That's fine. directly reading yeah. everything. I think, I think what I've learned um, in my year and a half in CTE is that we compete with our sending schools for funds. Okay. So there is the perspective that some across the state, some of the sending schools don't send kids because they lose funding. They, they have to send tuition. So our tuition formula is very complicated. We um, can bill tuition on a six semester average. So right now, for example, I have 75 Spalding kids, but based on the six semester average, I bill tuition for 61 of them. And, and so the reason that that formula was adopted a long time ago, I think it was 2004, maybe 2007, is so that the sending schools don't have this high, suddenly high tuition rate because more students got accepted into our programs and then the next year it's way down. It makes it so they can really plan for and budget for because our tuition goes into their budget. What happens with our funds is we get some directly from the state, so 87% of the base rate um, comes to us directly for the FTEs of students we have in that six semester average. I have 204 students in my building right now. I have an FTE this year of 154. So 50 students I have in my building, I don't charge tuition for. That means the tuition is a little higher because I charge it across the 154 students instead. Does that make sense? Not really. <laughs> but it is the way it happens. Um, so. Some of it comes directly, then the remainder is built to my sending schools. So for instance, my tuition next year is going to be 18,700 about, and about 8,000, a little over 8,000 of that will be built to the, the sending schools for the number of FTEs I supposedly have based on that six semester average. So that's how I get my funds. And then we do have some additional funding. Perkins pays me about $247,000 out of my overall $3.5 million budget, just to try to get a little perspective. I have to do a ton of work for Perkins, it pays a little bit. And I think that's probably true for our state college system as well. What's your annual budget? Um, this year was 3.5, it's going to be four next year because we are including academics and going full day next year, at least that's our current plan. Um, one thing that I also learned from my son's experience is he uh, did the two-year program at Randolph Tech for diesel and then aspired to go on to college to get both diesel, automotive, and high-performance motorsports because he wanted to be in NASCAR, honestly. And he went to the University of Northwestern Ohio because they had access to NASCAR-related pieces, uh, not because there was anything um, else. Really, that's what drew, they had the racetrack too. The college has a racetrack. That drew my son. Um, and he That's had the perception, <laughs> he had the want. perception, yeah, right? yeah. yeah, that VTC would be harder, that he would have to do more academic classes than he would if he went there. What he found when he got there um, was that, yes, he had a lot more hands-on opportunities, but he had to basically repeat everything he'd done at Randolph Tech in his first year there. And then he got hit with COVID and they went remote, which means academic courses, and it didn't go well from there. <laughs> he is working for NASCAR though. So he is oh. working in the ARCA series Terrific. right now. He worked in the truck series for a little bit last year. So he did make the connections he yep. needed to, even though he may not have had the best story. What I learned from his experience is that some of his roommates even, who are in the same program and came from other states like Connecticut or West Virginia, they had attended technical high schools, regional technical high schools mm -hmm. in their states. So they had four years of experience and they had articulation agreements that allowed them to bypass those first year classes. So they didn't get bored, they jumped right into the next level. And it's really unfortunate that our students don't have the same experience.
experience and opportunity. So what's, how do we fix this? There are lots of ways we could. I think the pathway that we're starting with our health sciences program in conjunction with VTC and getting kids further um, while they're in high school is a great way to do that. I think if we had access to students sooner and we had the opportunity to have career technical high schools here in Vermont, which we don't right now, um, then we could provide students with more opportunities and a faster path. So while we have you on this, tell us a little bit about access to students sooner. So your son had to wait until he was? He was a junior. A junior, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. And tell us, because you know, this is, I mean, we have different schools across the state, but right. in this particular <laughs> circumstance, but I think in general, you cannot enter until you're a junior? So you cannot enter the regular programs okay. most of the time unless you're a junior or senior. Occasionally we can get permission for a sophomore to enter. Um, we do have exploratory programs and foundational, so pre-tech programs. Mm -hmm. So you can take ninth and 10th graders into those programs and if they're successful, then they can move on into other programs. There's, Senator Weeks. So ahead. just to kind of make it uh, tangible, what percentage of your students are 10th grade? In our regular programming, hardly any. I think we have probably two. Two out of? So I have 204 students, 24 of those are exploratory, so um, 180. Okay, perfect, thank you. Yeah. How many of those 10th graders would like, or 9th graders would like to be taking more of these kinds of classes? All of them. All of them, All that's of right, them. yeah. I mean, they appreciate the opportunity for exploratory because yeah. that, that takes them to the tech center and yeah. they get to get hands on. And honestly, it's a wonderful experience. If ninth graders could do exploratory <coughs> and 10th graders could go into program or at least a, uh, a chunk of academics and programming that directs them down that path. So um, I didn't, I don't think I brought the uh, proposal for the health sciences piece, but if we were ultimately to move forward with that, not just in our EMS program, but in our medical professions program, we could get kids in for exploratory as ninth graders. In 10th grade, we could have a health sciences curriculum program for them, and then they could split either into the medical professions where they're getting the CCMA and the phlebotomy, and then potentially nursing, um, starting into the nursing pathway, or they can do this EMS route where they're, they're doing their emergency services and the paramedicine piece and getting through that. That would be great. Is this a legislative fix, do you know? I can have which council yeah. Zoom. It is a lit. Did you yeah. see if Beth is available to Zoom in so we can get some language? Just good. So, okay, so it is a legislative yeah. fix. Okay, yeah. if we need to flow. Yeah, please. So, legislative fix plus uh, obviously the infrastructure. Yeah. I mean, yes. if, you're gonna, if you're gonna add a third of third new students to the student body, <coughs> that's, that's a quick thing. Yeah, and I'm turning away 100 kids a year, anyways, because I don't have the space yeah. in my current location and I don't have the funds to get another space. Yeah. 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 That's a lot. Yeah, I mean we have two hundred and ninety four first is round incredible. That's applicants. Right. Yeah. 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 Okay. Huge demand. Please go ahead. Uh, I was thinking the uh, there's another barrier and I, I lost track of it, so hopefully it pops back into my head. <coughs> Uh, oh, so the other barrier for uh, the health sciences is that we could provide co-op opportunities for kids. They could get out and they could work, but they can't unless they're 18 in the health sciences. Um, and I think there's mm, a lot of times there's a waiver for our students who are in co-op to do like hazardous mm -hmm. pieces. I don't think that's the scenario right now. I think they're just not allowed to be working in uh, paramedicine or EMT or in the hospitals until they're 18. I'm not sure if that's a legislative thing or if that's an insurance piece. That's the part that has been hard to figure out. So when we're doing this building inventory for uh, for the state, are you all playing a role in this with, in terms of, hey, it's not just about buildings that might be dilapidated, but new buildings, new spaces that we need to take sometimes more students. Do you know if you're in that? 
I would love that. Okay. If, if I could build a new center yeah. and uh, provide more programming for students, that would be great. Are, I don't know is how we get in that with conversation. This? Okay, so you haven't as a superintendent. No. Okay. Okay. No. okay. That's something that we just don't want to lose with you, AOE. Just mm -hmm. Yes, please, Senator Brewer. Are you attached to a traditional high school? I am attached to Spalding High School right now. We okay. used to be part of the Barry Unified Union School District, and we got our independence last year, so we're the fourth yeah. of the Technical Education Center uh, independent Are districts. you physically attached? We're physically attached. So is there, I'm just, I'm thinking out loud, but as more students might be migrating toward technical education, I'm wondering, if, you know, if there can be spaces opened up in the traditional school to so I'm taking a you couple serve. of those classrooms next year. I am taking okay. a couple of classrooms from them to expand a little bit so that I can move some stuff around and add a few students to programs because our programming is limited based on whether how s the safety pieces of it. So for instance, in an auto or building trades, I can only have 16 students with one teacher. I would have to add an aide to get five more students. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the barriers. Space is a barrier. But the classrooms within the high school are not conducive to being a shop. So right. we're not gonna, what do I need? I need a yeah. welding program. I'm not gonna get a welding program yeah. in one of the spalding classrooms. Right. I, need a, I need a place for that to happen, a Can lab space. A yeah, please, please, absolutely. Um, this is just a follow-up to that. Since we lost our tech center in Burlington, we've, we've sort of, um, I don't wanna use the word farmed out, but we've um, collaborated with local businesses and that's, we've had some like great success with that. And, I'm just wondering if that's something that you've explored or in your area. Our newest program, Design and Fabrication, is in the Vermont Granite Museum. Um, so we have explored that. I'm hoping that there's a way that we can open up something for a welding program somewhere with a partnership. We've, we've explored a different kind of partnership in our plumbing program when we couldn't find a teacher for that program. And so we, we took one of our subs, who's a permanent sub, and he's been in the classroom for consistency. And then Vermont Heating and Ventilating has partnered with us and provided us with a master plumber who comes in now three days a week. And so we, we contracted with them and we pay for him to come in. But he's providing that hands-on piece while my instructor who's in there every day and is not a licensed plumber is able to help with setting up the curriculum and carrying stuff through for the two days he's not there. So it, it, there's different things that get in the way and we have to be really flexible and finding flexible ways to make sure that we can partner mm -hmm. so that kids get that access to post-secondary that is required for us anyways, helps them to build pathways. They're gonna stay in Vermont if they can come to us and start learning the skills, meet up with a CCB or a Vermont State University system, or we, ha we also have ties with White Mountain Community College Whatever those are, they, they get some experience with college, they might go on there, they might take their apprentice exam in like electrician or plumbing, go to work for someone. So we have, I know some of our students are probably going to work for Vermont Heating and Ventilating now. Yeah. And, and that's a great start to their career and they'll pay for the rest of their training on the job. Yeah. Senator Williams. Kind of flows into the bill they had last year trying to get uh, contractors certified. I mean, it sounds like a a fit certified too. They had to be certified uh, in order to do contract. State certified. Oh, are you talking about a bill? Yeah. Okay. It, okay. It didn't pass. It didn't pass. Okay. But it was a bill. Okay. Okay. Um, say just a word about your facilities in general. We'll talk to AOE to make sure all the tech centers are being incorporated into this conversation. Yes. Okay. For the record, Tim Fisher, Vermont Agency of Education, Agency's Director of Communications and Legislative Affairs. Um, CG centers are included okay. in the facilities inventory, which is ongoing. And if you're hearing loud typing, I'm urgently teamsing with one of the sending teams messages to one of my uh, school facilities contacts to try to just, it's, we're in, in the process right now. I don't know where, um, where my career center is. Um, if I find something out before the end of this, I will let you know, but I, they're, I, in. they're okay. in the process, so you may, may not receive outreach yet, but okay. Right, Senator and it may Williams. go to the facilities director at Spalding because we lease the space that we have, so we have a lease agreement with them. That's that's my concern, is that in, in, That's in, my concern, too, there. yeah, yeah. Um, and, most, as, as the committee knows, most CTE centers are part of, of high school districts, so, or of school districts, excuse me, so. 
um, the independent career centers are a little bit of a, a wrinkle there. Okay. Um, yeah. But we'll check in and provide you an update specific. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. So I think it's important actually to know what the nature of the question is. Is the nature of the question, what's the condition of the current facilities, or is one of the questions potentially, are you, you, you know, is the footprint too small to serve uh, the, the student body you have, or the student body you could, uh, you, because you're turning away, given the limited footprint. It's just na the nature of yeah. the question is, is very relevant. That is, um, and, and I am by no means a, a, a good resource on this. I know that the committee has you, you have started to hear some testimony on school facilities and school construction. The inventory is very comprehensive. The inventory, excuse me, already, already happened. The assessment is very comprehensive, and par part of it is attentive to those questions in Act 72. The, the thinking behind that, that underlies Act 72 is not only are facilities functional, workable, modern, Etc. But do they also serve the learning needs of students today versus when they were built? Because many of them were built a generation ago, right? So, so yeah, those questions are being, and that exhausts my knowledge on its own view. Well, they also questions. they'll ask Ms. Emerson questions such as, "Hey, uh, is the welding program what we need now in 2000? You know, it, is the equipment all of that kind of thing what we need in 2023?" I think we benefited from some of the. We didn't necessarily get ESSER funds, especially if we we're an independent yeah. CTE, but we did benefit from the gear um, equipment from the governor. So there are, were there were some grants that got a lot of equipment there. Okay. So most of our equipment is up to date. I mean, certainly Great. we could probably use more. I don't have a welding program, so I don't Well, I'm thinking that. automotive is yeah. must be changing all the time. Yeah. Right? I mean, yeah. so. We have a partnership with Subaru. Okay. So we're able to Great. get some of their training. Um, a lot of our kids go up to the 802 group as co-op students and get trained there and stay there. So it's a good pathway. Great. Any final questions from Ms. Emerson before we hear um, from uh, President Grayall? It's very helpful. Really helpful. Yeah. You'll stick around? Yeah, thanks yeah. for having me. Great. Yeah, thank you. Mr. President, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Good to see you again. Good to see you too. So, um, as you know, you heard the prompt, just trying to understand our career technical institutions in high schools and, and certainly at BT, at Vermont Tech, what's happening there um, and how we can be helpful in, around needs and resources. So, the floor is yours. Thank you for the opportunity to come back. Um, I believe uh, we had a great conversation before about where the university will head yeah. uh, moving forward. Uh, but today's uh, charge is to uh, share with you Vermont Technical College's specific uh, programs and where we are with those and what uh, needs we might have related to those. Um, Vermont Technical College, as you know, is one of the um, best maybe bust up secrets uh, because it's such a, it ranks nationally very, very high, especially in return on investment. It's number one in the country and uh, uh, number nine or so, uh, number one in Vermont and number nine or so in the country. So this is really, really good news. Uh, but that said, uh, our tuition is still high. The way we we have reduced our tuition, as you know, the basic tuition got reduced to about less than ten thousand. But then these technical programs that we have at Vermont Tech and the faculty student ratio requirement from the accreditors make us you know the cost goes higher. So we come we charge additional fees to the students. When we reduced our basic tuition, we decided that we cut our fees for these particular programs by at least 1,000 for all of them. So that's what we have already done. Um, but still, these students that come to these technical programs are mostly Vermonters and would stay in Vermont. And if 
the critical scholarships and or you know critical occupation scholarship or other means to support these students uh, we could produce even more students through these these programs um, nursing and or health sciences is one group of programs that BPC offers uh, nursing is our biggest program currently we have uh, 422 students this fall uh, enrolled in uh, three different nursing programs. Our LPN program, 182 students, ADN, 143 students, and RN to BSN, which is 100% online program for nurses that are already registered nurses, are taking this undergraduate program. We have 97 students. That program is growing. Uh, it's growing faster than we could add faculty. And uh, that's one of our problems because uh, we can't compete uh, with nurse educators who are, if they work in clinical environment, they get paid a lot more. And we can't pay them as much. So that's uh, one issue that we face. We have a similar issue with our engineering programs where we can't compete with other universities and or with industry because of the salaries that they can earn other places now. But we are doing our best. We have some limited mechanisms like a side let agreement that we work with the unions to kind of increase the salary of a faculty that we recruit. But uh, it is still, it is a limiting factor to get a high quality faculty member uh, to our institution. Um, in addition to nursing, uh, dental hygiene, we have 65 students, radi radiological science, respiratory therapy, uh, veterinary technology, and paramedicine program. These are all Vermont tech programs in the health professions arena. In engineering, we offer in fact, a range of programs, um, the Aviation Professional Pilot Technology Program is our largest program, and that is at the Williston campus. Then software engineering, um, mechanical engineering technology, electrical engineering technology. One good thing about Vermont Technical College is that we offer certificate programs, we offer associate degrees, we offer highly competitive full undergraduate engineering programs. That part, we need to do a better job in marketing because those students are highly successful because we offer hands-on technology-oriented training, but they get full undergraduate degrees. And though the placement rate within their field is close to 100%. There are so many alums in different uh, organizations, they are basically pulling our graduates before they graduate. That part is very good. I wish we can produce more. We can recruit more students and, and produce more. Um, information technology is another significant program. Diesel power technology. Architectural engineering technology is a unique, unique program that is highly successful because all the students are getting jobs and that program nationally got recognized as a uh, zero energy uh, program just recently so that um, it's kind of carbon neutral energy design. Uh, that is a great recognition for, for that program. And civil engineering, manufacturing engineering technology, electromechanical engineering technology, these are high-end programs, so we have the facilities. Having added now advanced manufacturing center that brings in additional technology, um, we would be able to offer even more cutting-edge training to our students in terms of the placement. So I'm not worried about our students being placed because we provide the right kind of training. Um, with the Advanced Manufacturing Center, we are able to create a brand new certificate. I shared that last time with you, a 3D technology uh, certificate. 
which is in the area of 3D printing. And it is an interdisciplinary program that faculty came together and uh, created. It will offer opportunities to high school students and also to our own undergraduate students, no matter what major, they can have the certificate program on the side. Um, in terms of the uh, plumbing and electrical apprenticeship program, I believe Kathleen mentioned to you last time that this particular program, now we have started to offer it remotely and therefore <coughs> our enrollment almost doubled because working professionals can take advantage of such offering. That's investment in technology and also due to uh, COVID, you know, we had to pivot so our faculty got the experience or build the experience of teaching some of these programs online. Um, we have uh, new funding to uh, continue and expand our Global Foundries uh, Maintenance Technical Apprenticeship Program, which is a program that we have for uh, many years now, but that program would be expanded so we would recruit more high school students, possibly from CTEs who are you know, a little more technically oriented. And the opportunity in the semiconductor industry, they need a lot more workers in that area. So, so you, this, were you really partnered with Global Foundry on this? That's a complete partnership. It's great. Correct. It okay. is, uh, we basically train their employees. Yeah. So any new hire they will have, they will hire into that apprenticeship program. It's a three-year program. Then we teach the technical side, and they get to work uh, on their job yeah. for the rest of the hours. And it's a very good, very good program. Um, dental therapy program is also one of the programs that uh, Vermont wanted uh, really badly. And uh, there are very few institutions in the country who has that program It's a new field uh, between the dentist and the dental uh, hygienist. It's like almost a dental, like a physician's assistant, right? They can do certain things, maybe a filling, maybe exactly. some cleanings, exactly. stuff like that. Okay. So they can do more things than a yeah. dental hygienist, right. but little less than the dentist. Okay. Um, so that program, uh, we have brought it back on track. Great. And it is, uh, we are now developing, finalizing their curriculum, and we would be submitting our uh, uh, CODA accreditation application uh, within the next few months. So, Mr. President, you don't have um, you don't have students in that program right now. No. no. So you are in the process. So, in with regard to getting people sort of in the field, four years down the road, would you say six years when we we might start to see dental assistants in the in the workforce? Any idea? Um, uh, not before four years. Not before four years. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Uh, okay. We may. If we, the past that we have now restarted the program, yeah. um, we are now at a path that we may be able to admit students next fall if okay. everything goes well and we get quickly accreditation. If we are not able to do it in the fall, we may have to start in the spring. Okay. Uh, thereafter, it takes you know four years and, and beyond for the completion sure. of the program. Yeah. Question. So UVM has a dental hygienist program. So are you gonna, you gonna dovetail with their program or is, is it gonna be a separate program in uh, Randolph? Right, so uh, VTC also have a dental hygiene program mm -hmm. and so do uh, University of Vermont. The dental therapy program, according to our CODA accreditation, that's the body that will look at the curriculum, they do not yet do not have a path for a dental hygienist to come in and just take you know one year or two year courses mm -hmm. to get to dental therapy. They are asking us to develop a standalone dental therapy program. Uh, some skills of the dental hygienist would be required. We would need to meet that, but it's a it would be an independent program. Dental uh, Association has to, over time, they will get there. Right now, they, are, they haven't uh, envisioned a, a program that builds on hy hygienists and then to therapy and then to the dental school. 
Chancellor, did you want to add anything there? I, I see a look up. I'm not sure, puzzlement or anything. No, well, CODOR is, I mean, again, all our programs, specialty programs like engineering and then dental therapy um, have to have special, meet special accreditation requirements. So NETCHI, the New England Commission for Higher Education, generally accredits our institutions. But um, CODOR is the one for the dental, uh, dental hygiene and dental therapy. And again, they're very, it's very challenging. So we're somewhat at the whim of, uh, of the accreditor in terms of their timeline, they meet twice a year. And, yeah, sure. You know, so again, if everything goes perfectly, maybe we could do it by full of 24, but uh, 25 looks like the yeah. more realistic goal. Senator. The reason I ask that is because we hear about um, declining student population. Uh, you know, if we're competing with our own schools, same thing with uh, the CTE programs. If the traditional high schools are competing with the CT high schools, um, you know maybe this would be a good thing, and we'll actually bring students into the state, right? Um, which was what we hoped for, yeah. and we're also going to be kind of growing our own contractors and technicians yeah. right. because there's a shortage of in the state. So I'm just you have the physical uh, facility to to increase what you're doing. Correct. So uh, for for this particular program, dental therapy, we already have built the sim lab, so we are ready for that. Um, in terms of the uh, all the other manufacturing, engineering, and other programs, uh, currently we do have the facilities that that we need. Um, a broadband workforce. You, that's a new. Uh, you know, there are a lot of grants in that area right now. Uh, we would need to produce the, train the technicians who can lay the optic uh, fiber uh, for that particular program. We are developing a specialized program for that, uh, like an apprenticeship, uh, that uh, would most likely be ready to go by spring. Um, so that's uh, another, you know, workforce related program. Uh, that we do have. Okay. Um, I, uh, I'm already, rhythm. Yeah, I, yeah, that's okay. No, no, no. Uh, I just, I'm just was thinking that uh, what else uh, I, I need to highlight uh, the critical occupation scholarship would be an important one to continue so that uh, some of, you know, it needs to. Even the college students, if they can take advantage of that, that would be good to produce our own, uh, you know, technically minded folks. Um, a CTE collaboration is uh, uh, very important to us personally, especially from VTC's perspective. Um, we need to really figure out uh, new ways to build these collaborations because this is a group of students, you know, who are inclined to go into those areas who will seek out CTEs at early age. And if we can build a better way, you know, financial arrangements, whatever we can do to have a seamless pipeline. Uh, with the new way of delivering some of the even technically oriented programs, of course, with hands-on that will occur physically at a particular site, but some of the technical stuff can be uh, shared with the students and or students could be taught remotely as well. So VTC would be looking for opportunities where we could partner with CTEs more and uh, use our faculty to deliver some of the technical material while they can get hands-on experience with the facilities CTEs have. Um, that it's uh, not an easy uh, piece to uh, you know, further develop, but we need to be kind of think innovatively how we can do that. And VDC would be willing to partner with every CTE in the state. Um, if you can kind of think about the funding mechanisms that make sense for everybody. So, curiosity along this line, 
the demographics of CTE? Are they primarily uh, younger students who are coming out of CTEs or are they mid-career students? Mm -hmm. Which, yeah, those, who's at BTC? Do you mean the demographics for BTC? BTC. Oh, for BTC. BTC. Right. Uh, BTC, we get both kinds of students. We are getting students that are traditional age, uh, some even from out of state for especially engineering programs. Um, but we also get a lot of non traditional so students. Um, oh. I don't know. Yeah, I, I can't answer that okay. question as of today. Yeah, well, they, it may depend on the program. I mean, for example, nursing, we know the nursing, the average age of our nursing students is around 29, 30 years old. Okay. So, That's helpful. Right. So for a lot of them, their second, second career or whatever, or you know, they're working, they've got kids. I mean, so again, we do serve a lot of non-traditional <coughs> students. I would imagine most of the CTE ones, though, are going to be, if they're coming from the CTEs, they're going to be more the traditional age right. students. Gotcha. Okay. Very good. Yeah. Uh -huh. <coughs> Being nursing being one of the largest programs, so that balance will sh shift towards you know more you know fifty percent or so students would be not traditional. So your nursing program again, just in just to get a sense of it, a third of your student population at BTC. Uh, yeah, exactly. Oh right. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And yes. if we uh, combine it with uh, our Casselton student uh, population, we are close to. Um, 800 or so students in the nursing programs and a uh, few weeks from now we will have a uh, nursing program accredited coming to Castleton for our master's program. Uh, so we would be training uh, our educators also through the master's program. So within our state colleges about 800 nurses are in the pipeline. Correct. Yeah, by the beginning. Or, or maybe more if you include the CCV. Right. Okay. It's great. Right. Okay. Right. okay. Okay. Yes, yeah. Senator Hashim. Quick question with, for those 800 nursing students, do you have any idea how many tend to stay in the state versus uh -huh. how many decide to become traveling nurses or, or just go somewhere else? Um, most of our nursing students are in state students, so they are Vermonters. Right. Um, Sorry, I meant yeah. after they graduate. After they graduate, uh, uh, we don't know. I think yeah. this traveling nursing is a recent, yeah. you know, uh, yeah. phenomenon. So we. Ms. Lavasier say... may have something. I can answer that. Yeah. Um, about eighty-three percent of our nurses license in Vermont mm -hmm. after graduating, with the average age in the VTC program being twenty-nine to thirty, and with the dispersed program around the state, we're really talking about students that are already embedded in their communities, yeah. and so the. The allure of the travel opportunities is uh, not as robust for somebody who's 30, 31, 32 as it is for somebody who's, who's 22 to 24. Yeah. Um, so 83 licensing in the state, um, I'm not sure I could tell you how many are still licensed in Vermont five year hence, but yeah. that's a, a really, really strong statistic for us. Um, and we're graduating about 375 across all of the um, steps in the ladder program. So practical nurses. Yeah. Associates, RMs, bachelors. That's true. And a master's program to come. Right. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Great. And uh, one more thing about the facilities for the nursing programs, because we are a distributed nursing program, because as Catherine mentioned, they are mostly working people. And for them, we do need to continuously improve our delivery method, technology, uh, how we deliver with the limited faculty uh, all the coursework at these different sites. They need to be, um, you know, we need practical sites, we need uh, labs where they can do the simulation work and then get to get into the hospitals. Those collaborations with hospitals are also another piece that's so localized in different parts of the state. And therefore, anything we can do to further improve our technology uh, delivery systems uh, to make the learning environment better and quicker for them would be a good investment to that. Thank you. Terrific. Ms. Emerson? 
I'll be right back. Okay. All right. I do have a question. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Yeah, terrific. Very, very helpful. Very helpful. Do you have something else? No. No. Okay. I think uh, we have Mr. Bonini. Why don't we bring him in? Two more folks. Gonna get over to BTC one of these days. Yeah, see what's yeah, going on. yeah. It's like I can't even envision you, your strategic plan for includes your physical facilities. Yeah. Because like, as you add students, you're gonna have to and technology changes, you're gonna have to have exactly. that. Yeah. We were just in institutions this morning. That's it? We were in institutions this okay. morning. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Rob, thanks for joining us. Good to see you. Good, thanks. Have you had an opportunity to listen into some of the conversation? Yes, yep. Uh, great. I listened to uh, Jody and the VP president. Great, great. So uh, I see you have a, a PowerPoint uh, that you're going to take us through. Is that accurate? Great. Yep. Am I, am I like the great and powerful Oz up here on a big screen or something? <laughs> uh, you, you, well, well, you're not huge, but yeah, you're about, half, you're about a, yeah, half a screen, maybe a little less. Yeah. Um, so why don't we, uh, are you able to pull that up? Sure. All right. So Hayden will pull up the PowerPoint. Um, All right, Hayden, can I uh, just share the screen? No, I think uh, we'll have you pull it up. Yeah. If you want to share the screen. I think we'll just have to okay. pull it up. Yeah. Yeah. Which one is, which one is, this is wrong? That's right. Is this the Rutland? Is this the Rutland? This is Bennington. We hear Rutland. Oh, Bennington. This oh, oh. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So go ahead, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, um, so uh, Hayden, are you gonna be clicking for me? Is that how we're gonna move through this? Yes, yeah, when you want him to move it, uh, just give him, the, give him the word. I'll just do a little, <laughs> do a little clicky clicky. So, okay, sounds good. Um, well, again, uh, uh, Hayden, if you could scroll back up to the top there, that'd be great. There we go, awesome. Um, so again, my name is Rob Bonney. Uh, I work at Southwest Tech, uh, which is the regional technical high school for uh, Bennington County. Um, I'm also the president of VACTIA, which is the Vermont Adult and Career and Technical Education Association. So um, I'm really coming to you with two hats on today, though you can see I'm actually wearing no hat. Um, I guess that would have been funny if I had two hats on, but um, uh, so that's really, I, I serve the dual role in presenting to you today on this. So uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Southwest Tech first. Uh, then I'm going to move into uh, discussing adult career and technical education statewide. So Hayden, can you uh, click to the next screen, please? So like I mentioned, uh, Southwest Tech serves all the high schools in Bennington County. That is Mount Anthony, which is Bennington. Arlington, Burn Burton, which is Manchester, and Long Trail and Dorset. And we also uh, have students who come to us from Hoosick Falls uh, over in New York. Uh, we get about uh, 200 students, I'm sorry, 400 students uh, throughout the year. Um, and there's a list of the programs that we have. I like to list these programs because the, the first little arrow there is the programs that you would typically think of that a uh, technical center would have though uh, we have some others that people don't always realize could also be housed at a tech center. Uh, Pre-law is one. Um, I believe we're the only tech center in Vermont that has a pre-law program, uh, but we do also have business and accounting, graphic arts, law enforcement, and also TV and video production. So uh, we have a wide variety of programs here. Um, they are not all what you would think of as the typical shop classes, and so we really serve a wide variety of students with a lot of different types of interests. We've heard uh, from some folks that they have, you know, they're having to turn away a lot of students. Is that accurate down our way as well? That you're you're getting a lot of students who are interested, but you just can't fit them in, or do facilities, you know, allow for larger populations? Sure. Uh, so there are certain programs um, that we do have long waiting lists for. Uh, okay. In particular, auto technology um, is one that we always get way more applications for than we can accommodate. 
And uh, uh, Mike Waller, who is our superintendent, has been desperately trying to come up with a way where we can have a either a satellite auto technology program in the North Shire uh, or expand the auto technology program that we have. Um, obviously, a, a shop is a very expensive thing, an auto shop, um, but that is one program where we do have to um, pretty much every year turn away students. Most of our other programs were able to accommodate the vast majority of students who want to attend. Um, medical professions is another one sometimes where we don't have enough seats um, because that's a very popular program as well. Uh, though I would say most of the others um, were able to have full or close to full, um, depending on the year. Building trades is also very popular uh, as well. So it, it kind of depends on the year, uh, but auto technology is certainly one we were, where we are often having to turn away students. Uh, Southwest Tech uh, is lucky. Um, we are uh, attached to Mount Anthony Union High School, so it is very easy for students just to come over here uh, to take classes. So that is a huge advantage. And we have, I think, one of the newest tech centers in Vermont. Ours was built in the mid-90s, I believe. Uh, Southwest Tech and also River Valley over in Springfield, I think are the two newest buildings. Um, but, you know, the 1990s, I, I was in high school then, so that's still a while ago. The building is starting to show its age a little bit. Rob, what about a young person, and I think this will go to you, Jody, also, who wants to be a teacher? Is there any opportunity, have you ever considered letting people into these, creating a program where somebody can try teaching out just to see in their senior or junior year if it's something that they might like? Yeah, so um, our human services program is focused on early education. Uh, so okay. we certainly people in there who want to be preschool teachers or early yeah. educators, elementary educators. Um, though people in there often are also focused on perhaps working with people with developmental disabilities or social work or something like that. Um, I know the Agency of Education, I think through Perkins, offered a, like a, a tech ed teacher curriculum. So somebody who's interested in becoming a tech ed teacher could also enroll in human services and perhaps learn about how to become a teacher, uh, a CTE teacher uh, as well. I, I don't remember the name of that off the top of my head, uh, but that's an option. So um, it is focused on early education, um, but students who are interested in that field um, certainly do often enroll in the human services program. Um, and we're lucky we have a child care that's attached to, it's a community child care, but it's attached to the human services classroom. So they have their own their own lab of sometimes crying and screaming children next door, um, but it's a, a good introduction to what early education can be. Well, I'll just leave that little nugget that, you know, we are looking for people to try out what it's like to teach high school, what it's like to teach middle school, elementary school, get them in, you know, to be assistant teachers, paraeducators. There, there's certainly a need. We, you know that we have a, we're down about a thousand uh, school personnel right now, a thousand plus. Many of those are teachers and trying the job before jumping into it makes a lot of sense. Uh, Randolph has an education program, so okay. I know some students that have attended that program are able to go and, and work in elementary schools, for example. Great. You, you definitely don't want a high school student working in high school. Fair enough. Good point. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we used to have a human services <laughs> program very similar to what they have yeah. before I came to CBCC, and they did um, get rid of it. I think there was low enrollment, and I think that happened there were some changes around licensing of child care facilities, and I think that um, CBCC decided to not do that piece for whatever reason, and I wasn't there, so I don't know. Um, but they removed that because they did have child care there when I was a teacher at Spalding. Okay. Um, but the program was removed before I got there for long enrollment. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Rob, please continue. Great. Thank you, Senator Campion. Um, so uh, my specialty is adult technical education. Um, and I, I don't just call it adult ed because people get mix, things mixed up. So um, there's adult technical education, which is done at the technical centers. And then there's adult basic education, which is done at, here in Bennington area, the two, Bennington, Manchester, the tutorial center. Um, and then there are other Vermont adult learning and other areas. So um, I make sure to say adult technical education, just so that we're clear that we're talking about the tech centers here. Uh, so at Southwest Tech, my goal is to serve about 100 people a year uh, in person and online. 
Um, we offer a variety of different programs uh, that offer people skills that they need uh, to either upskill or go into a new job, generally entry level type jobs. Um, and I partner uh, with the typical players um, that you would expect, Department of Labor, Reach Up, um, Higher Ability, uh, local industries, all those other groups uh, to help find out what their needs are um, and also work with um, the agencies who can refer people to me to take the classes. Uh, can you click to the next slide, please, Hayden? Uh, so just a little sample of uh, what adult technical education looks like at Southwest Tech. Uh, our most popular program here is licensed nursing assistant. The LNAs are in high need uh, throughout Vermont, especially as we have an aging population, more and more people need LNA services. Um, and that is our most popular program here. We also offer commercial driver's license. We have a CNC machining class starting next week. Um, dental assisting is a new one here. A dental assistant is an entry level position in the dental field. And um, my organization, Bactia, is partnering with Vermont State Dental Society on this um, to develop a, a viable and uh, easily portable uh, dental assisting program. And so we're just out of the pilot phase and enrollment is increasing, which is great. And I also do custom courses for industry as well. Uh, specifically, I partner with Com Command Composites, which is just down the road. We just completed an Excel class uh, for a bunch of their employees. Um, and we're gonna be doing more work with them moving forward. So we do have some new classes starting. Uh, as you can, I put them in bolts. They're a little easier to see there. Uh, welding, uh, we have a computer basics class. We have a lot of people in our community that need computer skills. So that's gonna be starting. Uh, computer skills will be starting at the end of February. And then this summer, uh, my forestry and heavy equipment teacher has offered to teach a heavy equipment operation class, a, a small heavy equipment operation class uh, over the summer as well for folks who want to learn how to operate uh, heavy machinery. So we also have some online offerings um, that are popular, uh, medical administrative assistant, IT support specialist, and legal secretary. So, uh, and those online programs do offer industry recognized credentials um, that people can earn after completing the program. So. Um, in addition to the on the ground sit here in the classroom and or be out in the lab, we do have some online offerings for folks who um, whose schedule don't permit for them to come here to the tech center. Uh, we try and keep tuition affordable um, so that there's a good value in what we do. And so I just wanted to show you the range of uh, what it costs to take a class here. Obviously, CDL is going to be the most expensive based on the cost of having a truck, a teacher, diesel fuel, maintenance of the truck, all those types of things. Um, but we can do others like the computer basis class that I talked about. We can do that fairly inexpensively. Uh, and I do want to point out that uh, in a lot of ways, VSAC is really our number one partner um, in these classes. Um, you know, Mary Lynn Turchikoff and all the EOC counselors around the state, including um, Martha McCoggan, who handles the western part of Vermont, you know, they really, really do yeoman's work and making sure that the funding is available for adult learners who want to take the classes at all the tech centers, uh, that that money is, if at all possible, available to them to cover the tuition. Um, low and middle income people in Vermont, we, we encourage them all to work with VSAC because they're, they're generous and the money is there for people to take these classes. So. I wanted to make sure I had a shout out to, uh, to VSAC um, in this presentation as well. Uh, most of these programs are fairly short term, um, which is important. Adults have lives, uh, they have children to take care of, they have other jobs to go to. So we try and keep these programs compact so that they can get the skills that they need and again, get up skilled, get a promotion at work or find a new job. Um, and what I'd like to point out is uh, a lot of these programs that we offer are on uh, McClure's list of top jobs in Vermont that I keep right here on my desk. Um, so, you know, we, many of our tech centers use that as a guide when developing adult technical education programs as well, um, based on these are things that we're looking for here in the state. Uh, Hayden, can you click for me, please? So Rob, just so you know, in terms of our timing, uh, we've got about seven minutes before we've got to move to Rutland. So hopefully that works for you. No problem. I've only got uh, three more slides to go and I'll okay, keep going. Great, thank uh, you. There are, yep, there are 17 tech centers in Vermont. Uh, the, the little stars there on the map kind of show you where they are, though. Southwest Tech seems to be sitting in Stanford for some reason. I'm not quite sure why that is, but 
Um, every tech center has somebody in an administrative adult education role, um, though it's an it's it really varies around the state. Um, we have some tech centers that do very little with adult technical education, and we have some that do a lot in adult technical education. And uh, so certain regions of the state are being better served than others uh, through adult technical education. Like I mentioned, I'm the president of VACTIA. Um, so I did want to mention that our organization has a website that we um, we really work hard to drive traffic to, and we list all the classes at the tech centers on that website. So folks across Vermont who are interested in an adult technical education program not only can go to the each technical center's website, but can go to our association's website and see what classes are being offered. Um, we do focus on industry recognized credentials uh, because that's important and that's something that the state is looking for, um, and that's something that it, some employers uh, are looking for. Um, and I do want to point out that high school students are eligible and encouraged uh, to enroll in these uh, IRC uh, granting programs. So um, we talk about adult education, but it doesn't necessarily mean the second you graduate from high school. Uh, many of these programs, including LNA especially, um, are available to high school students as well. So I listed a whole bunch of examples of classes that are offered. Um, LNA, CDL, and welding tend to be the most widely offered um, throughout Vermont, but um, certain regions have specialties as well. And I've listed them for you just to see the, the wide variety of programs that are offered through adult technical education um, in the state. And of course, some places have a teacher who can teach something really interesting that locals may be interested in. Um, so you can see that some of those are things that uh, we also continue to offer um, locally, um, depending on a teacher's availability. Uh, can you give me another click there, Hayden? Uh, I think this is my most powerful slide here. Um, and what I really want to point out to the committee uh, is that adult technical education serves a lot of students. I, I really believe we're a hidden gem. Um, sometimes we get a little forgotten about in these CTE conversations. Um, but over the last four years, we've served a lot of students. Um, and you can see we have a very high completion rate for our classes. And, um, you know, we've issued almost 3,300 uh, industry recognized credentials over the last four years. So we're a significant contributor um, to getting to those goals of having a, what was it, 75 by 25 or something like that, having, you know, a lot of um, Vermonters certified. Um, and having industry recognized credentials. And we've been a huge contributor to that uh, through adult technical education. Uh, though we have one big center who's not been able to report yet on their 2022 numbers. And so these are gonna go up uh, a little bit next year. I do wanna point this out um, and that's why it's in bold. Um, there are five centers and I have an error in there because I'm not from the Northeast Kingdom and I mixed it up. Linden Institute should actually be St. John's Berry Academy. Um, so my apologies on that mix up there, but um, there are four centers that have a full-time person, adult in adult technical education. Southwest Tech is one of them. Um, Stafford, who you'll sounds like you're going to hear from next, North Country, uh, St. Johnsbury Academy, and then Center for Technology in Essex uh, is a big enroller of students. Um, and but we are serving the five of us are serving more than half of the students. Um, in adult technical education. The other, the other 15 centers generally have somebody part-time and very part-time doing adult ed who are serving the other 50%. So if you are in Bennington or Rutland County, the Northeast Kingdom or Chittenden County, you've got pretty good access uh, to adult technical education. Any others area of the state, it's a little more spotty uh, depending on how much time and energy that person has to devote to adult tech ed. Uh, and then can we just click to my last slide there, Hayden? I just wanted to put some takeaways on there for all of you folks. Um, again, don't forget, adult tech ed is out there um, in this CTE conversation. Uh, we believe that we're a very effective and nimble part of this program. We can respond quickly uh, when an industry needs some training. Um, we've got great classrooms and labs that are dark at night, um, but we can utilize these things um, and programs for adults can be there. Um, and my mantra is, you know, short-term, cost-effective, and flexible CTE training. That's really what we do uh, as well. The challenges, honestly, um, in some reasons, are finding students to fill classes to make them economically viable and also finding willing instructors. Um, in some fields, you make a lot more money, um, as I've you know, heard from the VTC conversation. 
um, make a lot more money in industry than you do teaching. Um, and, you know, funding for adult CTE is somewhat inequitable uh, around the state um, and in many cases inadequate uh, to fund um, and making sure that there's time, energy, um, and facilities uh, to offer these programs in certain regions of the state. And grants come and grants go, you know, and we struggle each year to know where the money's coming from uh, for adult CTE. So really our big ask and our big goal, you know, my job as president of ACTIA is a more consistent commitment to adult CTE statewide. So that's, that's our ask, that's our hope. Um, and uh, making sure that uh, folks remember that adult CTE is a, a big part of this uh, CTE system as you saw in the numbers in the previous slides. Rob, that, that was great. That was that was incredibly helpful. Uh, so again, and you guys also, you're getting kids from 10th grade or 11th grade on, 11th and 12th grade? Is that when they're entering? Yeah, I mean, predominantly seniors will take an adult technical education course, but we okay. do get some juniors in LNA um, because LNAs only have to be 16 um, for, to okay. have that job. So we occasionally get some juniors, but um, mostly seniors for LNA and CDL. Um, when we ran EMT here, we would get some seniors from the health professions class uh, in EMT as well. Uh, so it's, I mean, they're a captive audience. They're already here and we can get them an IRC. So, you know, why, if you're here in high school, why, why not leave with an IRC in hand? Uh, so especially in some of these high needs fields. So, um, you know, we, we try and make sure we offer that to our high school seniors as well. And there is funding through the Department of Labor right now uh, for high school seniors to enroll in an IRC course through a technical center. So um, we're trying to, to tap that funding as well. Committee questions. I mean, I, uh, I know I, I blew through a lot there, so. Yeah, no, it's great. It, it, it's, it's incredibly helpful. Uh, so the youngest, so are you, can you get a ninth grader who wants to jump in? I go to the graduation just about every year, or you know, the awards assembly yeah. down at the Elks, and it's great. I mean, it's incredible. And I guess, you know, I'm just thinking, if, if I'm sitting next to a kid who's been studying cosmetology, how long have they been doing this? You know, is it usually just their senior year? Is it their junior, senior year? Yeah, so the, the students that graduated the, the award ceremony, those are program students, and those are generally, they've been in the program since 11th and 12th grade. Um, yes, in, 11th, in the okay. program. Yeah. program. Yep. Yeah. Um, so those are generally students who have gone through two years of a program yeah. for cosmetology. Sometimes it's even a little bit longer, just based yeah. on the number of that they have to get. That's one program that's <laughs> a, a little more challenging, especially at a half-day tech center. I think one thing that I just CTE in general, you need to know is that some CTE centers in Vermont are full day centers. Students come all day. Um, yeah. I think that may be the case for, for Bill and at Stafford and Southwest Tech is a half day center. Um, so we're all held to the same standards, which is a little challenging when you only have students for half a day versus full day um, and what we're expected to be accountable for. So, um, you know, there, there are different, not, there are different governance structures around the state. Um, and there are also um, different daytime structures on how long we have the students during the day. And that's, in, that's important to keep in mind. Yeah. It's not yeah. always not comparing apples to apples. Right, and some of them are, have full, the kids there full day with their half day program. So it's two hours a day is a half day program for CTE, four hours a day is a full day program for CTE. So CBCC is full day, mm -hmm. but we don't yet have the kids full day. We have them for the four hour program. Generally speaking, would it be helpful to have more uniformity around governance? And okay, I'm getting the sense that yes, maybe. Well, I'm not sure governance is really the problem. It's funding, right? And I, I think Jody would agree with me. It really is about equitable funding um, and putting a system in place where we are not competing with the high schools for funding. Right. Right? Schools. And it's also an issue of scheduling because. Uh, especially at a large place like Stafford that has like 10 sending schools, you know, every school that they serve has a different schedule. Um, mm -hmm. You know, here at Southwest Tech, we have three different schedules we're trying to balance. So, I mean, those are some real logistical things that would be very, very helpful to, to solve as opposed to what type of board do you have? You know, like I, right. I think yeah. all our boards do a good job yeah. uh -huh. helping us manage our centers, but we have these other huge logistical issues that cause a lot of problems in trying to get students an equitable amount of time in the program. 
Um, and you know, funding can is a disincentive to send to, you know daytime students. I'm not talking about adult students here. Um, you know, that, yeah. that's a, a huge yeah. problem. So a non-competitive funding model would be, I think, item number one. Yeah, I've been hearing yeah. about that for years. Yeah, I mean, we have different amounts of sending schools coming to us. I have six. We have uh, different. They all have different graduation requirements. So that's what our high schools did across the state. So there's so many things that are different across the state. It's hard to pinpoint one, but funding is certainly the area where we can, we can collaborate more and compete less. Senator Weeks. I do have a question, but I, I see we're a little time constrained. Is Rob going to stay online? Yeah, Rob, can you stick around for a little while? Yeah, I can stick video? around for a little while. I just have to head out by 4.30. I, yeah. Oh, yeah, we'll be done. I think we're yeah. probably about 20 minutes or so for uh, maybe a little longer for our next person. Great. Okay. Is Mr. Lucci? I think Mr. Lucci's here. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Hey, Bill, how are you? Good. How are you doing? Good. Thanks so much for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks for the invitation. Yeah. So uh, I believe, yep, you sent us a presentation, uh, and do you, I, you want to have him share screen? Is that better? Great. Okay. That's okay. Oh, terrific. Um, and you want to take us through it, and then we'll uh, jump in with some questions. We've got about 20 minutes or so, if that works for you. Sure. Yep, that'll work. That'll we can work. Fly, we'll fly through the slides. Yeah. Um, I, just, I, I saw Terry Williams leave. He's my fellow citizen of yeah. Pultney. Oh, he'll be back. He'll be he'll back. Be, he'll be back. back. Okay, that's great. Yeah, he'll be back. Yes. Yeah. So, so I'm, uh, I'm I'm Bill Lucci. I'm the assistant director for Adult Tech Ed here at Stafford Technical Center in Rutland. Um, been doing it for close to 20, 20 years. Um, and just by way of the some other things that I'm involved in, I'm the chair of the committee for career and technical institutions at uh, the New England Association of Schools and Colleges. Uh, Jody was talking about comprehensive high schools. Uh, Massachusetts and Connecticut have um, some of the best um, comprehensive high school uh, technical centers. I'd be real, as, as the chair of the uh, Committee for Career and Technical Institutions, I'd be happy to set up a field trip for you if you ever want to go and see a four-year comprehensive high school career and technical center in one of those two states. Um, I'm also uh, was appointed by Governor Scott to the Vermont uh, Standards Board for professional educators. So I sit on that board representing the administrators for the state of Vermont. And my, uh, my little girl who's graduating in, um, in, in June from Rutland High School, Governor Scott was kind enough to appoint her to the State Board of Education. So um, she's been- That's terrific. Yeah, she's been sitting on it for a couple of years. She always says- Yeah, I think we had her in committee last year. She was terrific. Thanks. Well, yeah, she really says she's great. my boss. And uh, yeah, good, good, good. I tell her she's not. So that's a little, a little background for me. If, um, if you wouldn't mind progressing to the next slide, Hayden, thanks. So I don't know if, um, if you've seen this, this uh, wonderful billboard. Billboards are illegal in the state of Vermont, but if you put wheels on them, they're not. And <laughs> here is um, compliments of the, uh, the Agency of Education put out a competitive grant last year for Act 51. We won one of those awards and uh, we used it to promote uh, workforce development and career and technical education uh, for our uh, commercial driver's license training program. So you, this, this rascal goes uh, anywhere from Bennington all the way down to Middlebury in that uh, Route 7 corridor. Um, and uh, we get a lot of uh, mileage, a lot of, um, a lot of commentary on that. Um, it, it rolled out in November. Um, so it's a pretty nice little thing. Thank you very much. Now, next slide. So a little promotion for New England Association of Schools and Colleges. We got our accred accreditation visit um, last November and they came to our school for four days to uh, determine whether or not we deserve to be accredited again. And um, the chair of the committee after he left, he said, your school is just crazy and amazing. I think he meant that as a compliment. Um, <laughs> To, to our school. Uh, next slide, please, Hayden. Thank you. So our, our focus on um, workforce development in, in my area is uh, thinking globally, not just what Vermont needs, but what uh, the country needs as well. And frequently they're, they're in parity. Um, and we're, we're required to treat workforce development as a business um, here by, um, 
our school board, Round City uh, Public School School Board. So I'm required to break even with anything that I do and offer um, to uh, in, in order to the sustain the uh, the efforts of our workforce development program. Next slide, please. So we, we start with like knowing the people in our community, in our Rutland community. Um, they're our customers. So we're I'm frequently out there talking with uh, area businesses, trying to develop, uh, cultivate many meaningful relationships with them and asking them like, what do you need for your incumbent workers? And what do you need for the people that you're looking to recruit into your organizations? Um, that takes time, but it's, it's been pretty profitable and fruitful for us. Uh, next slide, please. Here's some of our uh, recent customers uh, within the last year or so. The Spa at the Woods in Killington, uh, Cedar Hill Continuing Care Community, Genesis Healthcare, Agrimart, uh, Cisco, and Hubbardton Forge are just a few of the uh, businesses that we've provided um, uh, workforce development training for uh, in the last year. Uh, all of these people are you know, high paying and demand jobs in, in healthcare, manufacturing, commercial transportation, and then in, also in personal care. Next slide, please. Our educational collaboration, uh, we, we work closely with Ed2Go, which was purchased by Cengage Learning to operate a number of our um, online courses that we do. Um, we work with Vermont Adult Learning to facilitate their ability to access these courses without having to use a state credit card all the time. They'll sign their students up and then we will build them for that. So we actually handle the registration process and payment process and they reimburse us, which has proved to be pretty helpful in terms of their ability to get their clients access to online training. Uh, from, I can't say enough about Vermont Tech. Uh, our relationship with them over the last 20 years has been um, nothing short of amazing. Um, in particular with um, uh, General Electric, uh, it used to be General Electric Aviation, they divested in their GE Aerospace now that based here in Rutland with 1500 employees. We do a yeoman share of their um, apprenticeship program training and workforce development in conjunction with VTC. Um, and we've done uh, the Vermont, uh, prior to COVID, we did the Vermont State Electrical and Plumbing Apprenticeship Program through VTC and a variety of other initiatives along the way, including getting their dairy farm management students from the uh, Randolph campus, their CDLs down here in Rutland. We partnered with them to make that happen for them. Uh, next slide, please. Our agency connections, uh, the VTRANS, uh, we've just won our second three-year contract to deliver uh, customized, accelerated, four-day, all-day welding and metal fabrication training to 100 plus state municipal uh, garage employees over the last couple of years. We do it right here in Rutland for them. Uh, those, those incumbent workers are paid. Uh, they come from as far north as Lowell and as far south as Wilmington and from towns uh, west, uh, the west and east uh, in Virgins and St. Johnsbury. Uh, they all converge on our campus in the summer, and we do this intensive training, uh, customized training for VTRANS. Uh, we also work with the Vermont Department of Labor to help some kids who are struggling, who had graduated and had no career plans, and we did an eight-week career and technical education exploratory summer program for them so that um, more than a dozen kids could come in and experience career, possible careers in uh, video production, electrical, uh, culinary arts and welding and small engine repair. Uh, next slide, please. Um, our allied health sector, we work uh, in, with partnership with Community Health. They operate 10 community health centers in the Rutland region and two now two dental clinics provide, we, we customized a program for them on site and uh, put, so far we put 45 uh, people through the, the Certified Clinical Medical Assistant Program uh, that we developed along with their, uh, their partners, uh, or uh, I'm sorry, their practice leaders at each of those facilities. Um, and we've delivered a program, to a training program for them, uh, where at the end, if they pass the, the licensing test, they earn a credential from the National Health Career Association. We've done 
uh, a medical coding certificate program with Rutland Regional Medical Center, working with their staff. And uh, those people didn't necessarily stay in Rutland. Many of them are now working at Helen Porter, Springfield Hospital, Gifford, um, as well as Rutland Regional Medical Center. And uh, the largest long-term care facility in Rutland is uh, the Pines. And we, uh, th they were kind enough to always offer us a space to do uh, the, cl the clinical program, uh, part of our LNA program. And during COVID, when we were prevented from uh, providing uh, training because our schools were closed, uh, the Pines created a classroom for us there where we could actually bring our teacher and our students on site at the Pines and the Pines uh, served as our, our remote classroom during COVID so that we can continue to provide licensed nurse assistance that were desperately needed, especially during COVID to area nursing homes. Uh, next slide, please. Trans uh, transportation sector, uh, we've, we've got the only CDLA be an upgrade program in the state uh, that's operated through a career and technical center. Uh, the A program means tractor trailer license. We have a tractor trailer um, and we, we do this program and have been doing it for about 12 years. Uh, we do it only on Saturday. So people who are employed uh, and cannot afford to go to the proprietary schools, quit their jobs and go five days a week, uh, eight hours a day for eight weeks. Uh, we do it on Saturdays. It takes you a little bit longer to get the license, but um, it enables people to continue to have a revenue stream coming into their household. And one of our outstanding partners, Casella Way Systems, uh, we, we hybridized our CDLB curriculum for them so that they could expedite uh, incumbent workers through a certified license program like ours um, and get the CDL in two weeks, uh, the B license in two weeks through Casella. In return for that, uh, sharing our curriculum with them, they were kind enough to build us a remote, a, a classroom in West Rutland that was far nicer than the one we were renting in North Clarendon. And we now share that space with Casella Waste Systems where you don't have to pay rent or utilities. And it's a much finer learning environment for our students that are coming in who are not Casella employees. Next slide, please. Manufacturing and technology. We go down to Brattleboro uh, for VTC and uh, have provided academic evaluation and assessment for candidates in the GS Precision program that they have a, a program that's delivered by VTC, but VTC asked us if we would go down and evaluate candidates uh, for suitability for enrollment in that program. And we go down there and do that in Brattleboro. Uh, OMIA, which is a, a local uh, calcium carbonate manufacturing facility in uh, Florence, Vermont, just up the road from, from us. They asked for us to create an industrial maintenance and troubleshooting program for them uh, and uh, computer tech skills combined with computer um, technology skills. We created that program for them and delivered it on site in Florence. And um, as I already mentioned, GE Aerospace, uh, we've developed um, custom design welding and metal fabrication classes for them using titanium, which is their primary uh, metal that they're used over in the plant to make veins and blades for aviation. Um, and we did, um, for four years, we did uh, for their human resource department, all of the, um, at, all of the um, employment skills testing for candidates who had applied. We did all of the screening and only sent to them the people who, who passed the skills tests that GE required in order to be interviewed. Uh, we, we did, um, in, in four years, we did over 900 candidates to General Electric Aviation. And we, we deployed those, um, those screening skills uh, or those, those screening tests to these applicants on holidays, weekends, and nights so that they could continue to work in whatever job they were in while they were applying to GE. Uh, GE Aerospace. And next slide. So just a, 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 I know that Hayden might have um, distributed copies of the slides. You can see some of the workforce development programs that we've done that I've just um, spoke of and number of hours and what, what uh, credential is earned and the employment options that they have and some of the programs that we deploy here at Stafford. Next slide. Next 
So we put the work in our workforce development strategy. So what, what we get is I get tremendous support from the Rutland City Board of School Commissioners and the Rutland taxpayers to be here full time and doing what I'm doing. Uh, we've got uh, our VSAC outreach counselor, Martha McCoggan, is absolutely unbelievable in connecting people with any financial opportunities that are available for our adult students. Uh, we have customer sensitive pricing strategies. So we keep our prices deliberately uh, low so that um, our, the funding available to VSAC is generally enough to cover the cost of any of the, the employment programs that we're offering through us. Um, employer buy-in for fee-for-service philosophy. So GE Aviation was paying us about $37,000 a year to do all of their pre-employment screening. So that money went directly back into the coffers of the taxpayers of the great city of Rutland. Anytime you're making money for the city, uh, they tend to be very happy with that, with that strategy, seeing money coming in and not just money going out. Um, we have uh, direct access to school-based high-tech classrooms here in our facility. We're pretty fortunate to be able to do that. Uh, all of our things are tied to end of training credentials that credentials of value or a license. We don't offer any workforce development program that does not lead to a, a credential or a license that's going to get somebody employed that, that employers um, appreciate. And next slide. Uh, we, we we've taken it uh, uh, beyond our region. Uh, last year, uh, we got a call from Burn Burton Academy and enrolled six um, Burn Burton high school seniors in five different programs here in our night programs. Kids that did not know what they were going to do when they were going to graduate in June, they enrolled in our programs. Uh, they were in welding, they were in CDL, they were in phlebotomy, they're uh, in our cosmetology program at night. And um, we just love Burn Burton Academy, um, Chairman. We, we love Burn Burton. Um, Thank you. And uh, we assembled a cohort of a dozen LNAs from outside of our region. Uh, there's a medication nurse assistant program that leads to a uh, credential, um, an MNA credential that's tied to their uh, existing LNA license. There's only two, uh, perhaps three, but there are only two. Uh, tech centers in the state, uh, North Country, and uh, our center that offer the MNA. So what we did was um, for Bethel, Springfield, and Randolph, they had a bunch of LNAs who needed that credential, but couldn't find a place to do it. So we hybridized our program. Uh, we made it both on site here at Stafford a couple days a week, and then we went to their long term care facilities where they were employed, and we um, we got. It was a total of uh, 14 started off and a dozen finished uh, and got their MNA uh, credential. So they would be able to uh, do the med carts in long-term care facilities uh, to help out because of staffing issues. That credential allowed them to work alongside a, uh, a nurse, an RN or a BSN, and actually deliver uh, and dispense medica certain medications to patients in long-term care facilities. And the last one, well, it's appropriate to say thanks. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to uh, squeeze everything in in 20 minutes. I'll take any questions that you. It was, it was terrific, uh, Bill. I think one thing that I'm just going to, it's a bit of an ask for all three of you. If you could get together, and I don't know who would take the lead on this, but if we could get you know, five or six points from all of you, what we could do legislatively or what you need uh, from us to expand, to you know, broaden, whatever, the, the work that you're doing. So I would think what, what might be on there, <clears throat> do we look to, to give greater access to a wider range of kids? Do we make sure that you're all part of the facilities inventory? Uh, and then anything else, whether it's funding, uh, access to capital, et cetera. If, if you wouldn't mind taking a week and kind of thinking about that, and maybe two weeks, week and a half, whatever, and come back, maybe Jody you could come back uh, or zoom in and, and just provide that to us. That would be helpful. Is that okay? Yeah. Is that reasonable? Yeah. Okay, and Hayden will loop back. Do you need a week? Yeah. Do you need a week? I'll be back next week. Anyways, for the All right. All right. 
Uh, questions? Any other questions? Yeah, please. Uh, yeah, so so having uh, the three different representatives uh, here simultaneously is it's a phenomenal uh, opportunity. Uh, so we, we in in a different committee we've been discussing childcare, and we have a obviously statewide we have a lack of childcare uh, providers, but. It, uh, I think Jody uh, an hour ago or so mentioned that they used to have a program, but uh, the program folded. I'm just kind of wondering what the impediments are to, you know, if we have an LNA program, could could we, you know, is it conceivable to have a child care provider program uh, resurrected in the state? It's just, just a general ask. We, we do have one here for the high school side, and it's generally full. It's not considered child care, it's a uh, literature-based preschool. But we, to bring the kids in, each of the high school students that are enrolled in the program are matched up with a tuition-paying uh, youngster from the community. Uh, they're between the ages of four and six before they actually start public school. So it, it's sort of child care, but our teacher bristles if you use that word. Um, they, they say we're a literature-based um, child education program, and it does. Re it's been doing really, really well here for a number of years. Um, so it's it's helping people in the community who need childcare, and it's helping our students to actually have hands-on uh, opportunity to educate little children over the course of the school year, which is great. It's a great program. And, and what I can say from the adult ed side, um, as we had a, uh, to follow up on what Bill said there, we had a, a program we tried to launch statewide last year um, called Step Up to Child Care. Um, it ran as a pilot program up at North Country Career Center before COVID hit. Um, and, uh, you know, multiple tech centers tried to launch Step Up to Child Care, and none of us were able to successfully enroll enough students to make that program viable. Um, mm -hmm. So the, the problem that child care centers are having finding staff is the same problem we're having finding people to enroll in a training program for child care. And there were multiple reasons for that. Um, you know, people didn't want to pay the tuition to enroll in that. It's a low paying field. So why would I do a training, expensive training program to, mm -hmm. you know, take a low paying job? Um, CCV already does some of this stuff through the Northern Lights program. Um, so uh, it has been tried. Um, through adult technical education. Um, unfortunately, uh, nobody was able to find enough people to make it financially viable to run that program at their center. I would say that um, through our comprehensive local needs assessment that we do every two years for Perkins, we find out what our community wants, what our in local industries want, what our students want. Um, and it is not rising to the top in central Vermont for us. Okay. I know that there's clearly a need, but there's yeah. not, it's not among the top five, even for us. Of what people want to go Of what into. students want to go into yeah. or what industry is calling for. I think our schools, our sending schools are looking for a way to do that. And I bet we could partner with them because they have teachers who, young teachers who are having children and can't find childcare and that causes a problem too with your teacher ends up being a stay-at-home mom instead or stay-at-home dad instead of being at school. So that it is certainly a need. And I, I heard that low, low income piece, like to start a program, we have to prove it's high demand, high income, high scale. And so now if that's true, if it's not among that list, then I think the list can help us to, to, to put some stuff up there that's not maybe high income, but we have to make sure we jump through all these hoops before we can start a program. So now that that program has left my facility, it's going to be very difficult to bring it back if I'm, if I'm not getting that feedback from my community. Can you, can you repeat high demand, high income, high? High demand, high wage, high skill. Okay. Anybody uh, working with the Agency of Agriculture? I heard quite a bit this morning, uh, continue to in the Ag Committee around meat processing, things like that. I know. Food hubs are developing in all of our communities. Anybody now? Okay. No. Okay. It's good to know. Okay. Senator Campion, one of the things I'd like to point out is that um, all this cool stuff you just heard from me and Bill, we are two yeah. people full time that have the resources 
to be able to do these cool things that you just heard about, right? Um, yeah. Not every region of the state has this. Um, and so um, we, we talked about some neat stuff, but you know, we're two of the people that have the, the time and the resources to be able to do this. I yeah, my course that. is not full time and we have two courses for adult ed for a lot of reasons, but that's one of them. Okay, Senator Kulik. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you this earlier, but I didn't want to interrupt. I know that um, Mr. Lucci, you mentioned the comprehensive uh, tech technical school, CTE, comprehensive school. Um, Beth Cobb mentioned that to me too, and I asked her, how would we do that in Vermont? I feel as though we don't have the scale. Uh, we don't have the population, we don't have the economies of scale. And I, I asked her, would this be like a boarding school type of situation? Because, yeah, anyway, go ahead. Well, the, the, the schools that I've probably, with my association with NEAS, I've probably evaluated for accreditation two dozen schools in the last seven or eight years in Massachusetts and Connecticut. Um, and you're right. I mean, the, obviously the population density in both of those states far exceeds what we have the capacity to do. Um, but if you look at what's happening in Massachusetts, especially, they're actually building uh, their, they have, their waiting lists are so robust for uh, CT full-time comprehensive high schools um, that they, uh, they're, they're, the Massachusetts um, uh, building uh, committee that they have through the governor's office, they're actually building, um, uh, there's one that just opened up that we did um, last year in Lexington, Massachusetts, one, uh, one of the most uh, affluent communities, uh, Minuteman High School, four-year comprehensive high school, the, the cost of the school was $340 million Whoa. To, to build. Yeah. So, and it's, it's a wonderful school um, and, and they've got um, a, a really nice, I think they've got 11 sending communities that, that actually send it there, sends kids there. Um, you know, if, if we had, I've, I've always thought that uh, Terry will probably smile at this, but I always thought that it would be nice to turn Green Mountain College into a residential um, CTE school, a high school slash CTE school, um, where you could put kids up um, and you and people throughout the state would send kids there. I think it would be a great, great opportunity for Green Mountain College, speaking as a Pulteney taxpayer. Probably a new order, but want to talk to you. What's that? So maybe the new owner would want to yeah, talk to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Senator Sheen. Uh, so I have a question that I don't know is going to be able to fit in two minutes, but it's, it's kind of to all three of you. Uh, you know, I was thinking about the, the 529 college plans, and, you know, I was, I was, I'm just trying to think of different creative ways uh, to support the college saving plans to encourage students and adults uh, to go into these different trades and, or to enroll in these different courses. And I was wondering if you, if any of you might have any thoughts or input on the, uh, on VSAC. It's VSAC, right? Yeah. VSAC's awesome. Uh, that would be my, yeah. uh, my feedback. Um, again, uh, the, the EOC uh, division that supports what we do in adult tech ed, I can't say enough. Um, Marilyn Turchikoff always says she's our number one fan. So, um, and we always really appreciate their support. So um, they are, that part of it at least is, is well-resourced and supports what Bill and I and all the other adult tech ed people do very, very well. So um, I have- Do you find that a lot of students are using those college plans um, to, to finance their courses? Not through adult tech ed, um, we're, because we're not offering college credit in our programs. Um, so we're not eligible. Uh, to receive those funds, but VSAC has what's called their Advancement Grant Program, which is specifically for industry-recognized credential, workforce credential programs, non-degree credit, uh, no credit program. And that Advancement Grant Program, that can be used for, for CTEs, for adults. Okay. Thank you. And there's another program that VSAC manages, the, um, the Curtis Scholarship Fund Certificate of Value Program. They just recently ran out of money that supplements um, the advancement grant. And they've also got a forgivable loan program that they initiated um, for CTE. 
uh, that that forgivable loan program, I've got quite a few people that are looking at that. It's uh, a pretty nice um, program for people who have, don't qualify for advancement uh, or COV, uh, and they're able to access that money. I, I, I just love to put a plug in for us being able to access Act 77 money. Um, mm -hmm. you know, the, 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 that, that fund, that you have to take class through the Vermont State College system. Um, we, we were hoping that that money would be, that a, that a kid um, at a high school who wants to come in and uh, get their LNA license or a welding certificate would be able to use that money uh, through our adult programs. Um, and it turned out that we've, we've got, that, that we were not able to access Act 77 money. All right, so we'd, we'd see something like that on the list. That would be great. Okay, absolutely. Great. That'd be one. So we'll look forward to having. Support with that, what Bill just said about that line. Okay, that's good to know. You guys are doing incredible work. Thank you so much. This has been incredibly informative. And I'm sorry to make you the sort of the automatic lead on this, but do you mean, mind being the collector of the info? Or you, you'll, you'll work. You'll work. I don't with... Mind creating a shared document with these two? And, okay, uh... and then ex send it around. Yeah. That'd be great. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks Rob. Thanks, Phil. Great to see all three of you. Really really Looking forward to yes. uh, seeing you uh, again soon. Okay. Thanks for coming. See you. Thank you.